Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, this uh, version of the webinar series, Conversations with the Dean. My name is David Chard, um, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this, uh, this series, which focuses on events, recent events, where in, in this series, we discuss um, important and hot topics with scholars and leaders here at Boston University. Um, this series that we started a few months ago is, is really deeply rooted in our um, ongoing efforts here at BU Wheelock. Each discussion focuses on the complexity of an issue and seeks to uncover the transformational opportunities for students and community, to help students, communities, and, and communities thrive, excuse me. Today's conversation specifically focuses on the topic of thriving. Often we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to help people who are experiencing challenges or obstacles. In today's discussion, we'll focus on the science of excellence. Uh, so now I want to um, let you know that if you have questions, please put your questions in the Q&A um, rather than the chat. We will try to respond to your questions and I will try to embed questions in my conversation with our, um, with our guests. And, um, we will also provide uh, in the chat resources that will help extend our conversation. So this is just a glimpse into uh, this particular topic. Uh, so this summer, the 2024 Summer Olympics in Paris will be uh, coming up. It's just around the corner. And each instance of these global games, we have the opportunity to see excellence play out on a world stage. What we don't often see or talk about is what is happening underneath both in terms of the years of training and commitment it takes to qualify for the games, as well as the mental fortitude and energy that makes performing at that level even possible. Recent coverage about premier athletes like Simone Biles or Michael Phelps has focused on their mental health and on the impact of handling and succeeding in competitive high stakes environments such as the Olympics. I'm curious how the science of excellence can help us all benefit from the experience of these athletic superstars. Today, we'll be talking with BU Wheelock's own expert on these issues, Dr. Edson Filio. Edson is an international authority. Welcome, Edson. Edson is an in, in, international authority in the field of sports psychology and an associate professor of sport exercise and performance psychology at Boston University, where he is also the director of the Performance Recovery and Optimization, or ProLab. Dr. Filio's research centers on performance optimization in individual and team settings. One of the aspects that fascinates me most about Edson's work and our sports psychology program generally is its focus on thriving and excellence. Often we focus on deficit mindsets in education and other fields of, in human services, areas where individuals and systems don't thrive. So I'm excited about learning lessons from sports psychology, which can be applied in other disciplines, something we could, will explore more at our forum in March, which is being hosted by uh, Edson and his colleagues. So um, Edson, we're excited to have you here today um, and we're going to jump right in. I'm so excited. I can't see everybody, but I'm happy everybody made it. And I'm excited for the conversation. Terrific, terrific. So um, we'd encourage you again throughout the discussion to share your questions in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to thread them into our conversation. I wanna get started um, on this topic of premier athletes, Edson, that have come out more publicly to, to discuss their own mental health. For instance, I'm sure you took notice when Coco Goff, the international tennis champion said recently, and I'm quoting her, I just feel like the media and everyone forgets that a mental injury is just as painful as a physical injury. Mental health is invisible, but it's a very real issue. So Edson, what's your reaction to this phenomenon? You know, it is great that we have high profile athletes speaking about this because one of the things of mental health is stigma. When we don't talk about things because I'm tough or I'm perfect, personal stigma, or I don't want to be perceived by somebody else as weak, social stigma, that's problematic, right? So when athletes come and talk about it, every kind of normalized, quote unquote, normalization, and people can talk about it. If we don't talk about difficult topics, body image, you know, self-talk, mental health, uh, perfectionism, we, there is no way to advance the conversation. So when these high-profile athletes 
humanize the conversation, you know, they, they hit the stigma. So more people can talk about it. And uh, that's exciting. And, and, and to me, it shows how one person can change a system or, a, or two or three. So I think systems, I believe very much in people because one person in a leadership position, one athlete speaking up, it can, you know, it can change a lot of things. So, you know, why there's, uh, you know, Michael Phelps or Coco, you know, people speaking up again and bringing up uh, the possibility of other people to speak up and the kind of challenging stigma uh, around mental health. So, but what is the cost of their speaking up? Like, clearly, I mean, you you work with athletes at this level all the time. I mean, how do they weigh the risk of stepping out and talking about the challenges they're experiencing and, and what can it mean for them? I think that they probably went through a process of reflection already, right? I don't know if they work for a sports psychologist or you know, a performance psychology consultant or through their coaches, but it takes a lot of internal work for people to be able to talk about it. So I think, you know, my reaction to, to, to your question is that they probably look at their light and their shadow and the challenges and, uh, and they felt comfortable talking about it. Mm -hmm. But the more people discuss mental health, the better it is. Because if you go down back in history, it is okay to say you're physically ill or, you know, or injury because of the body-mind divide, right? But, it's, but it's, it's a little bit harder to talk about the mind, right? Because yeah. is the mind superior, right? Is the soul superior? So if you look back, if you study the, the history of sports, you understand why it, it might be you know, challenging to sometimes talk about, you know, mental health. But, you know, to your point, I think, uh, I think they've done some internal work, you know? Yeah, it, it does seem to me we've had a history of, of always uh, um, uh, assigning stigma to vulnerability gen generally, right? And, and mental health in particular. Um, I really appreciate it. So Edson, tell us a little bit about your background. What brought you to this subject? this I'm sure. particular aspect of psychology. How did you become interested in it? You know, I grew up, I'm originally from Brazil, and I, I call myself a global citizen these days. But I, I, you know, I grew up playing soccer and indoor soccer futsal in Brazil. And I always loved being flow. What is being flow and being in the zone? It's like nothing else matters. You feel secure, you feel motivated, you feel excited. I just love that feeling of being flow. And I got that playing soccer. I could play soccer all day, futsal, uh, 11 on 11, on the beach. I would play soccer, right? And I love that. And then, you know, fast forward, you know, many, many years down the road, uh, I got into this sports psych lab. The professor, one of my professors gave me a lecture on the top, and I, I never looked back. So I, I am fascinated you know, by peak performance experiences because they are the end state. I think everybody wants to live in flow, to perform in flow, but it is very hard. And uh, and that's, that's my interest. And when you are living in flow, performing flow, the more you do it, you know, it gets you close to thriving. It gets you close to becoming an expert. What is an mm -hmm. expert by definition? It's consistent superior performance in the most challenging conditions. So for you to be an expert, you gotta be having those optimal performance of being flow. And uh, and as I said, that's the end state and that's why I love it so much. Hmm. So I'm gonna uh, uh, bring up an audience question that came up early. I think this, uh, this audience member works with middle and high school students. It, at what age do people start experiencing this thing you're calling inflow? And how do you help young people strive for excellence? That, that is a great question. Uh, I think as long as we're humans, uh, if you look from a neuro standpoint, uh, you have this, this, those experience, right? Uh, as long as I think you're able to, to grasp a little bit of consciousness. And uh, for the audience interested, you can Google neuroefficiency, transient hypofrontality. So my point is there's a structure 
uh, to the brain that explain those experiences at the human level. Now, for the youth, uh, I think it's very much about the environment. If the environment, what you call motivational climate, is it a climate that allows for people to have those kind of experiences? Because when you flow, uh, the motivation, you're doing the activity for the sake of the activity. And then people start uh, you know, not experiencing those optimal feelings anymore when the environment's not good because of the coach, because they're doing that for the mom and the papa, because it's not an internal drive anymore, that drive for life, right? Uh, so I think you start very young, and that's, in fact, what hooks people up. They start loving gymnastics, they start loving to swim, they start loving to dance or theater or music, whatever it is. And that's the first uh, step towards continuing in, in sport or musical arts. So I'm going to ask you what probably will be a controversial question, Edson, but um, is it possible to over-motivate a young person who maybe um, who, who maybe doesn't have either the physical capacity to um, become a superior athlete. And, and maybe you can use your own experience. Why aren't you a professional football player? That's very good questions. Uh, Brazil is very tough to make to the national team. So. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> but, you know, uh, motivation is a very complex thing. There's many, many good theories out there. Uh, you know, uh, I think that is the intrinsic factor. What is it that you like? And, you know, there's personality, there's environment, there's the family. But you can definitely uh, decrease motivation, right, by, by, by poor environments. If people are not making autonomous choices, it's not my choice, I'm doing because of the coach, sooner or later they're going to quit. If they're not feeling relatedness, if there is not good social relations, sooner or later they're going to quit. If they're not feeling competent, they're going to quit. Uh, so, and sometimes people start playing sports because they feel good, you know, I'm a good soccer player, but they stay because they made friends. But you start mm -hmm. exercising because you, you feel, you, you, you want to go with your friend, but then you stay because you became strong. So, and that's only one of the theoretical orientations for motivation. There are other, you know, theories. So, I guess you can definitely uh, impact people's motivation uh, for the good and for the bad if you have good coaches and, and good systems in place. I don't know if I froze or if Dean Chart froze. Okay, we're back. Sorry, sorry, everyone. I may have frozen. My, my apologies. Go ahead. No, I was just saying that, you know, you can, you know, you can optimize motivation and you can definitely drop motivation uh, depending on the systems you have in place, the environments you're able to build. And I think that's the main message, right? Uh, it, is it is, you know, theoretically, and in the research you know, people don't reach high levels of performance if they don't overcome motivational barriers. The literature call it motivational constraints. Uh, yeah. So motivation, uh, external motivation from parents or teachers or coaches of some sort is necessary, but certainly not sufficient to, to drive someone to high levels of performance in some areas, correct? Absolutely. I would, I would call support, right? You cannot make to high levels of performance and stay consistent and be happy, what you call excel well. You want to excel, but you want to feel well. Uh, without support. I, I haven't seen anybody and I haven't seen the literature. You need coaches, you need your parents, maybe your partner, maybe a teacher believed in you, maybe your government gave you a scholarship. Uh, and, and that's why I say it's very humbling to study excellence. You yeah. realize you need support. You know, you need the heart to heart, mind to mind, that mentorship, that craft. And... Um, so short answer, you know, without support, I think it's very difficult to, to get. So there are two related questions in the Q&A that I want to build on. One is how you help people, I think young or old, understand that failure is a part of 
ultimately building success, right? There's failure along the way. And then how do coaches really help people develop sort of intrinsic motivation to, to, to thrive? Uh, so how, how to help people? That, is that the first part of the question? Yeah, how to help people thrive? Uh, how do coaches do that? Should, uh, how should coaches do that? But also how do you help them under, how do you help the athlete or learner, however you want to describe it also think about failure as a part of that process? So failure is, a, is going to be a part of the process, right? And one of the things that people struggle, it's what you call maladaptive perfectionism, that this archetype, this idea that you're always going to be perfect, you're always going to perform at the top, you can never show uh, vulnerability. The hero archetype, you know, the superhero, uh, it's very problematic because if you always have to be perfect, and we're not going to be perfect always, right? Uh, that leads to rumination, and you know that leads to burnout and down the road. So first, we've got to challenge this idea that we have to be perfect. We call it maladaptive perfectionism because it's maladaptive, right? One thing is to strive to become better. Another thing is this maladaptive piece that you know you get fixed in this idea that you always have to be perfect, and you're doing it for somebody else. External regulation. You want to be perfect mm -hmm. because of your teacher, because of your parents, because of society, but it's not because of you. And, and, and you know, the exercise of uh, performance psychology and applied psychology, if you will, is to build self regulation, right? So the maladaptive perfectionist has that external regulation. How coaches can help people? That's a million dollar question. I think they need to know stuff. They need to know about goal setting, you know, what I call mental skills. They need to know about how to build confidence. They need to know about self-talk. They need to know about leadership cohesion. We need to educate people about those concepts. You don't learn it like that. It's effort. It is, I always tell uh, our students, sports psychology is a science and an art, right? The science is evidence-based research telling, look, this leads to better outcomes. And the art is how you deliver, right? The person delivering, it's important. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not the same person, you know, with the same effects. Uh, so short answer, we need to educate coaches because there is a science behind feeling well and performing well. Yeah, wow. The, the, uh, I can just tell you the audience has a lot of really interesting questions, but I want to jump back to one of mine, which, and then I'll I'll come back to the audience in a moment. But um, some people might think it's a little odd that a sports psychology program is located in a college of education. But I want to remind the audience we're in uh, the Wheelock College of Education and Human Development, so we're a bit larger than just education, but. Edson, talk a bit about the ways in which you see your work contributing to the larger guide star of our college. Uh, absolutely. You know, sports psychology, and today we call it sport, exercise, and performance psychology. If you go to AP Division 47, it starts with psychology and sports, right? There's a uh, synthesis. And today we see it applies to exercise and performance business and law across the across domains. And I say that because you're going to find sports psychology in kinesiology colleges, a sport bit, but also in education and, psycho and psychology departments because it comes from educational psychology. So we are in the right place at the right time in Boston uh, because, again, it comes from a combination of areas. And I think it contributes with this idea, you just said they apply the human development a bit, right? Because one of the things we do know is that very, very few athletes are gonna make it to the Olympics, right? Mm. But they're gonna learn about confidence, they're gonna learn about goal setting, they're gonna learn about leadership and cohesion. And and sports, I won't know the number precisely, but the World Cup final, it's one of the most watched events seen in the World, right? The Olympics is one of the most watched events in the world. I believe in sport so much, this, this ability to transform people and youth gonna play it uh, 
And in fact, I think uh, nearly every child in the world is going to have some ex uh, some experience with sport, right? Yeah. They might not have a you know a coach of all levels of education, but in Brazil, in, in Ethiopia, in Miami, they will be exp they will be exposed to sports. So there is this impact on the applied human development and life skills. Anybody that's interested in you know in the technical world, if you look at the life skills literature in sports psychology, uh, it's growing a lot because of what it gives people for their lives. Yeah, I, I, it also reminds me that ancient civilizations understood this connection between mind and body. And you can find in, in South America and elsewhere uh, fields of play, right? Where people were playing as adults. Um, not just as children. So uh, there are a couple of really interesting questions I want to kind of weave together here. One is, um, is there a genetic, uh, is it is there a genetic sort of capacity to be a thriving, successful athlete, or is it entirely environmental? That's one question. I, I'll I'll let you answer that because I think it's an interesting one. You know what the research says is that the definition of sport talent has a genetic component, right? So in the case, EO, you know, for some giving modalities, uh, it might be very hard for you to win a gold medal in Paris if you don't have that genetic background. Mm. However, we can't control that, right? So a lot of the research is how can we still optimize the environment? But there is an interaction. And I think since Plato, they discuss in nature nurture debate, and, and we haven't solved that one yet. <laughs> but, but yes, but, I, you know, people, that might be listening, it's very important that we be very critical with the sport genetic tests that we have these days. My, yeah. is, there's any student on the call, that's one of the assigned readings, right? Because the predictive validity is still low, right? So, you know, I just short answer, yes, that is the interaction, gene, genes plus environment, but we also have to be very careful with genetic testing without uh, serious empirical uh, research. So then the, the next question is about resilience in the face of challenging social environments. How do you help uh, young people, let's just say young people in particular, maintain balance and, and, um, and resilience when there's a weak social environment in which they're working? You know, that's a great question because, you know, we got to understand risk factors. You know, there is some, there's some people that might be exposed to more risk factors, but what it can help is with protective factors. That is the philosopher that says, you know, pain knocks on everybody's door. Everybody's going to be challenging life. You know, nobody gets a free ride, right? And then first we have to understand that. And once you understand that, what are the protective factors that can build into the system, which is has to be a proactive approach. That's what we call proactive instead of reactive approach. Can we equip people with emotional skills, with social learning skills, with understanding self-talk, with learning how to set goals? Uh, and I believe that people should have, you know, I'm not saying sports psychology, they should be, there should be an educational system somewhere, right? Uh, teaching people to face, uh, the challenge that they will face. Uh, but, you know, resilience is the ability to bounce back or bounce forward, uh, right? People also talk about not only bouncing back, but bouncing forward. But you will have challenges. And if you have the coping skills uh, before, you'll be able to, to, to move forward better. Uh, so, um... You have taught me a lot in the last couple of years, Edson, in our brief conversations about your work and its relationship to leadership development. And I um, was speaking with a Wheelock alum this morning who played on a BU sports team when she was in college some years ago. And she was telling me she's had a number of conversations with you about leadership and how the work you and your colleagues are doing in in uh, perform exercise and performance psychology. Is that right? Sport, exercise, performance. Um, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about how this translates to leadership and um, 
and working with teams. You mentioned the concept of cohesion. I just say mm -hmm. a little more about what, what you know from the research in this area. Uh, absolutely. You know, the very first important thing of leadership, we have autocratic, democratic, transactional, transformational, authentic. There's so many things out there. But it's really important that people learn how to set goals. The definition of leadership is moving people towards goals. So, you know, when you talk about our guide star, right? So, and setting goals is the definition of leadership, is in the definition of motivation, direction of effort, and is the base for confidence. So you gotta learn how to set goals. And I tell my students, you gotta read. You gotta read that stuff. I know it might be a little bit boring, but you need to learn about goal setting. And, and you know, the second thing on, on a practical side, you know, pragmatic hat is, uh, it cannot only be only about yourself, right? That's the way I lead. That's the way I am. Doesn't work because leadership has the person, the, the follower, that is the situation, and that is the leader. Hmm. So I think, you know, if you try to lead kids, it's an obvious point, right? But it's still going to make it. If you try to lead kids the same way you lead faculty at BU, it's not going to work. And, and different situations require different things. So sometimes... The leader has to make the decision. Sometimes that's, you know, an autocratic. Sometimes you have to make the decision. If you're saving lives and, you know, there's a fire, you know, you say, we're going to go through that door. There's no time to vote if you go through the door of the window, right? So the second one, if you listen to people, every vote has to count the same, right? If it's a democratic vote, your vote cannot count twice because, uh, you are the thing. Everybody, everybody, every vote has to count once. And then there is transaction leadership. It's a transaction, right? You pay people better, they work better. And there is transformational leadership that is beyond the I, is the we. But what it is important across leadership approach is to be fair. If you're not fair, sooner or later, we call procedural justice, procedural fairness, if you're not fair on a day-to-day -day basis, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to lead people. And if you cannot set goals, you're not going to be able to lead people. And then you can read all these approaches I mentioned and, and see which one fits you better. But uh, those are some ideas that come to mind of leadership. Say, say something more about uh, team leadership and cohesion. Someone has asked whether it's important to convince children to cert, to be on in team sports or whether if they choose individual sports, that's okay. But what is what is team sports, particularly for young people, offer them that they may not get from individual sports? So what our research shows, I like to call it, you know, the baking a cake analogy. There's a few key ingredients that you learn. One is cohesion, which why people come together and stick together. That's one of the key ingredients that people learn and leaders should develop. And for you to feel part of a team, so you come and you stick there, you need to feel valued. What's your unique value contribution? So in good environments, you know, people will feel valued and they will feel part of the team and that's cohesion. You know, the other thing is uh, collective efficacy or what we call team confidence. Because you might be very confident yourself, but you might not trust your teammates. So self-confidence is different than team confidence. And that's the idea of we can do something and we will do something, right? So that's another of the key ingredients. And, uh, and then there is this notion that we call team mental models. It's knowing what to do, knowledge of what, how to do it, how to do something, when and why, right? You gotta make the right decision for the right reason. So there is this key thing process, this key ingredients that I think uh, people get from participating in sports and working things across the board and that are also very important for leaders to develop. Some leaders might be very good at developing cohesion, but less able to develop team confidence. So do you think it's important for parents or teachers or counselors to encourage students to be part of both 
individual kinds of activities as well as team activities in order to, to kind of develop some of these areas you're talking about? You know, I think that's, uh, I think people should follow their heart, you know, and, and the literature talks about it, you know, harmonious passion, find a passion that, that drives you forward. So if a kid is really happy running, you know, let the kid run. If the kid is really happy playing soccer, let the kid play soccer. But the literature also talks about uh, change hypothesis of personality. As you play sports, you learn things that change you. As you participate in an individual sport, you learn things that change you. But um, I would, I, 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 that would be my frame of mind, you know, let people participate in what drives them. And, uh, but it is true that, you know, group activities give you interpersonal skills because you get that practice. So there are a couple of questions that there are some better questions in the Q&A than I had lined up for you. So um, this one uh, comes from Magdalena, who is asking, um, she says, on a broader scale, how does someone like myself, a student with no background education on mental health and science, help someone slash a friend who struggles with mental health and help strengthen their mindset and resilience in sports, education, working and daily activities? I guess. My question was going to be, how does what you've learned kind of transport across complex and, and challenging environments? And I think Magdalene is asking the same question. Like, how do, how do we use this information in every aspect of our life? You know, I'm not sure that is a, a short answer, an easy answer, but I think if, if people need to truly seek, you know, education and, and development. so. You know, there are, uh, and you know, what I tell people, you try to find the better resources you can, maybe in your community. How do I deal with a mental health crisis or a mental health emergency? Read about it, you know, meditate, seek psychotherapy, you know, develop those internal sources that will help you to deal with people. And if you ever in doubt, you know, a good thing to do is to engage in, is to listen to. Say that and, again. Uh, That's a, to listen to, engage in. Is to listen to people. And uh, one of the core skills is active listening. But here's the thing. People, they really know if you're listening to them. They really know. And it's not listening. That's what I'm going to say next or my question. It's it's connected, right? It's uh, We are able. It's theory of mind. If people like theory. We're able to tell if they are paying attention to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so seek resources in your community, develop yourself internal, you know, do the work you gotta do and, uh, and you know, make sure if ever in doubt, you know, listen and, uh, and make sure you're able to refer to, to some other support. Yeah, that's a really powerful response. I, I appreciate, appreciate that. Um, so, I have a question and someone in the Q&A has a question. I'm gonna put them together. I was gonna ask you about how your field is evolving. What are, the, what are the areas on the horizon? But I'm also, I was listening yesterday to a news report about Caitlin Clark at the University of Iowa, the basketball phenomenon who is uh, about to break all records for scoring in women's basketball and the pressures she's experiencing from um, now being a paid athlete as a, as a college athlete, also getting um, uh, marketing contracts with huge uh, um, sums of money attached to them. Is our student athletes, um, are we, as I, this is sort of a rhetorical question, are we putting too much pressure on them? And is your field continue, is this still an area that is of interest to people? And how do you see your field changing in addition to the student athlete question? I think it's growing so much, you know, and when I started again, you know, 20 years back, uh, it was called sports psychology. And, and I told you, you know, it's now it's sport exercise and performance psychology. That's one thing. And I think it's gonna, just gonna continue to grow. And perhaps because your, of your very first question, right, there's people are talking about this more. So I think it's gonna continue to grow, you know, job-wise, but I think one of the trends we're looking at is the mental health, 
connecting mental health and the performance optimization. That's definitely one. And I think more and more technology is a factor, right? Uh, psychophysiology, some people talk about sports psychophysiology. And I, I mentioned about, you know, the genetic tests and the brain image. So incorporating the things that come along the way. And pertaining to the second part of the question, the pressure, uh, yes, you know, athletes and student athletes on scholarship and, uh, and you know, the resources they have it, uh, in some places is amazing. You know, there is a lot of pressure in there, performance pressure, social pressure. Uh, but that's why we need to equip people. There is different ways to deal with pressure, right? Uh, that is from cognitive training, you know, uh, some people will recognize from quiet eye to external focus to how you think about the situation, to mindfulness. And uh, there is so many ways. And the more you equip yourself, some people call it the toolbox analogy, right? Or some people say it's like, the more channels you have in your mind, right? You can change. So I think uh, equipping people with that and uh, is the only way I think. The more I study this, I do think that's very difficult to, if you have somebody qualified in sport, exercise and performance psychology, it's a, it's a resource you should use because um, there is so much in there and people can learn to cope with pressure so many different ways. So if I understand what you're saying is uh, helping people learn to adapt, um, build their resource toolkit, right? Uh, know what resources are available in their community. Um, no, no, no one's journey is going to be, there's no one size fits all is also something I'm hearing you say. Although of course, uh, the idea of developing tools and resources is certainly gives you a kind of a portfolio of things you can draw upon. Is that fair? I think that's, I think you summarize it very well. One of the things we want is this, uh, and that's, you know, is one of the approaches for resilience is this, the unshakable belief that you can adapt, right? Mm. No matter what happens, you can adapt. And the more resource you have, the better you are able to adapt. And again, this idea of self-regulation, right? Uh, how do we, I expand myself and I'm able to, to regulate myself. Yeah. Edson, do you think um, similarly, people have different journeys to becoming excellent? I do believe that, you know, they say, yes, uh, there are different roads uh, that can lead you there, but we do know that there's some things that are important. Support, you know, the, the, the support is definitely one of that, you know, the environment practice is very important. You don't get good at anything without good practice. So these are the elements that we do know are important. And we do know mm -hmm. that people go through stages of development, we call. And having the right coach or the right mentor at the right time is very important uh, as well. And when challenging happens, those transition, those change events, uh, having supports even more important. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you thought you was hoping I would ask? You know, I think... Uh, I, that one, you know, one of the things I, I would say at BU, you know, we developing, you know, what you call this performance optimization uh, interventions. You functioning here, how do you optimize your performance and well-being? And when challenges happen, your know, well-being and performance drop, how you recover that, right? So that's one of the things we're trying to do here at the individual level, right? Individual psychology, and at the group level, we psychology, group psychology. And we're also trying to impact those systems. So uh, that's what, you know, that's one of the things we, we're doing. And uh, for people listening, you know, we're excited to collaborate and, uh, and to bring those interventions uh, to different folks because traditionally it's been, you know, the research and the applied work hasn't reached everybody that needs to reach out. Yeah. I, I think there's application for what you and your colleagues are doing across even our own departments at BU Wheelock, like how do we think about leadership and teaching and leadership in school, school leadership and clinical leadership. So um, just so excited that you're with us and um, doing the work that you're doing. Uh, uh, 
what are you looking for in the Olympics this summer? I, I'm excited about, uh, first, I love just watching sports. But, you know, be, doing what I do, I can see so many of the, the psychological aspects, right? The cohesion and the performance anxiety. So I like that. And I also like listening to interviews. I tell that to the students, they laugh, right? But you see so much, right? We call attribution theory. How do you explain success mm. and failure and how uh, you can understand so much from people you know, explaining their performance and their trajectories. So I love watching interviews and, uh, and I just love, you know, enjoy watching the, the sport itself. That's great. That's great. Well, we're uh, drawing to a close. I want to make sure that the audience is aware that um, at the end of March, we host our annual forum um, for the uh, BU Wheelock. And this year, um, the forum is going to be hosted by Dr. Filio and his colleagues in the um, performance, up to per PRO, performance, Help me, Edson. The Performance Recovery and Optimization Lab. Recovery and Optimization Lab. Thank you. Um, so there's a QR code on the screen. Um, we would love to have you join us for the forum. Edson, any highlights, people that you want to tell the audience about who are going to join us for that forum that might excite them? We have, you know, we have an outstanding lineup. We have a Nobel laureate, a, a professor from MIT in Economy. We have the president of the International Society of Sports Psychology, is doing some amazing work on cross-cultural psychology and immigration and immigra uh, athletes that have immigrated. We have uh, uh, Olympic medalist. We have the president of BU. We have, you know, uh, ER physician. It's going to be amazing. And I um, hope to see you all there. You need to register because space is limited. And I just want to give a shout out to my colleagues, Dr. Carly Block and Dr. Anna Ward and Dr. John McCarthy. Uh, we've been working together on that, and they, you know, they uh, and the work we're doing here at BU uh, is a team effort, really. Terrific. Well, we're very excited for people to join us, so please be there if you can. I also want to let people know that we have uh, uh, another conversation with the dean coming up late in the month, February 29th focused on helping students leverage STEM to solve big world problems with uh, uh, faculty colleague, uh, TJ McKenna. So that second QR code, I think will lead you to a registration for that. Dr. Filio Edson, I can't thank you enough for um, being part of this. And uh, I think I always learn when I hear from you, it's a I think the think chat froze. He did, Edson. You are right. So, um, hi everyone, Megan. Me a whole line of, a whole you line of. a little bit, Shard. You're back. Am I back? Yes. You're back. Oh, I'm just thanking everyone. I want to thank the audience for the great questions. Um, and again, my apologies. I'm remote today, so my apologies for the weird Wi-Fi. But um, thank you all for joining us. And Edson, thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you, everybody. All right. All right. Have a great afternoon, everyone.